And good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to another live Xanadu Gallery online critique group. Today is Wednesday, March 30th, 2022. Great to be back here with you um, on a Wednesday morning for our group. Um, and of course, today's featured artist is a little different um, than our normally featured artist. Um, we do this from time to time. Um, normally, we're inviting uh, artists who we might consider colleagues and contemporaries. Um, and today we're going to be featuring an artist who is uh, dead. Um, and uh, we've done this uh, well, at least once in the past. Um, but the idea is we want to um, take an opportunity to look at an artist's work um, in some of the same ways that, that we look at each other's work um, and see what we can learn together, draw from one another's impressions of the work, and um, hopefully take some inspiration back to our own work and to our own careers. And so our artist today um, is Thomas Moran, who um, uh, was active in the mid to late 19th century, um, died in uh, 1926, so almost uh, 100 years ago. Um, and so it's a little bit further back than, than we're normally going. And um, I'm going to start and we'll begin the, the process, if I can get it up here. Um, I'm going to show you some, some of the images of his work that I include, included for review. And I'm just going to read a brief um, biographical sketch of the artist. Um, and so we'll start by, by noting that uh, Moran was born in 1837 in England. Um, and he was born to two handloom weavers. The rapid industrialization of the 19th century England soon mechanized the weaving process and forced Thomas Moran's parents out of their jobs, at which point the whole family was moved to Kensington, Pennsylvania, just outside of Philadelphia. At the age of 16, Moran be became an apprentice to a Philadelphia wood engraving firm, Scattergood and Telfer. Uh, it was in this position that he began to paint and draw seriously, working diligently on his skills as both a watercolorist and an illustrator. Um, in this, he had help and support from his brother Edward, who was an associate of marine painter James Hamilton. In the early 1860s, or excuse me, in the early 1860s, Thomas Moran traveled to Lake Superior, where he painted and sketched the landscape of the Great Lakes. Back in Philadelphia, he sold lithographs of the Great Lakes before setting off on another trip, this time to London, to see the works of the famed British landscape painter J.M.W. Turner. Moran, Moran's replications of the work so impressed the director of the National Gallery that he was given a private room to work in. Upon returning to the US, Moran wanted to go west again and paint, but had to wait for the right opportunity. That opportunity came in the form of uh, Ferdinand Hayden's 1871 geological survey expedition to what is now Yellowstone National Park. Moran was hired along with photographer William Henry Jackson to document the landscape of the region. He could not have chosen a better trip or companion as the combined talents of Moran and Jackson in documenting the geysers, hot springs, canyons, and cliffs of the Yellowstone Territory would be instrumental in persuading Congress to set the land aside as a national park. It was also the beginning of a fruitful partnership as Moran would accompany Jackson again on John Wesley Powell's expedition to the West in 1873. It was on this trip that Thomas Moran painted his two most famous works, the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone and the Chasm of the Colorado, both of which were purchased for a previously unheard of sum of $10,000 each by Congress to be displayed in the Capitol in Washington. With the money he was earning from his newfound fame, Moran again traveled to Europe, this time to Venice, where he purchased a gondola uh, and shipped it back to the United States in order to use it as a model for a variety of Venice scenes he produced after 1890. Moran moved west permanently in his old age, settling in Santa Barbara, California, and traveling to Acoma and Laguna Pueblos to paint the scenery and lifestyle of the native peoples. Uh, he died in 1926 of natural causes. And so um, we get to see some of um, uh, his kind of iconic work. And I think it's kind of interesting to think a little bit about um, the context in which uh, Moran would have been creating. He's a landscape painter. 
um, and in creating these um, scenes that have become iconic. He's painting in the style that was developed and um, came, became of note um, in the Hudson River School. Um, he was one of the third or fourth generations of painters um, painting in these styles, the, the uh, you know, the huge vistas and the dramatic landscapes, the lighting, the, the uh, contrast in chiaroscuro. Um, but he's also painting in a period when um, the Impressionists are coming to the forefront. And, um, you know, in some ways, um, Moran and some of the other Hudson River School painters are holdouts. Um, against the, these movements of Impressionism and, and increasing modernism in painting. So it's kind of interesting to think about um, you know, his popularity um, and his um, persistence in creating in his style, even through those changes that were happening in, um, in art history. And so let's go then and jump into some of your reactions to the work. I've got a couple of images that show us some presentation of the work, which we're all gonna be fairly familiar with this format, the classical European style frame uh, on an artwork in the museum. We're gonna see some of the scale of his work here. He did uh, some um, you know, almost uh, mural size <clears throat> works um, on canvas, which create quite an impression. And then let me get to some, uh, at least a couple of your reactions. Um, Leslie from Wisconsin says, um, this is a revisit for me, Studies uh, uh, studied his work briefly in college as part of an art history project. His eye for composition had its basic root in the grounded triangle. Each image possesses this, gives a sense of stability and peace while allowing the eye to move through details and colors. He employed a Caravaggio-like sense of high light dark contrast without the Caravaggio dark background. His contemporaries in the Hudson River School did much of the same type of work. His signature, unlike the others, was a consistent use of Prussian blue, cerulean blue and vermilion blended with bright highlights in flake white, blood paint and Naples yellow. Considered a romanticist painter, pastoral treatment, luminism, inspiration for Ansel Adams. And I would suspect many other artists who have followed and Laurie Woodward um, from Tucson says, I first saw Moran's paintings in a book at a used bookstore in 1992. I bought the book. He's been a favorite of mine ever since. His work is recognizable. It's on original in 2013, a legacy gallery. Love his watercolors of Yellowstone too. And yes, I, I also go way back. Um, I worked actually at Legacy Gallery in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. We didn't have a Moran at the point, but um, we had an Albert Bierstadt when I was working there beautiful large piece. And that kind of introduced me to the Hudson River School. And um, I've been an admirer ever since. And whenever we're visiting museums, we got to go to, um, Carrie and I went to the National Museum um, in Washington, DC. And there are a number of his pieces there along with other Hudson River painters. Um, and just recently we were at the Met in New York and saw some, some great examples of of his work and, and again, other artists in that school. Um, and so I am also a great admirer. I'd like to open it up now um, to uh, the group and just take um, your impressions and reaction to the work. Are you familiar with Moran's work um, previously? What, how does it strike you? Um, go ahead and feel free to uh, click on the hand icon or raise your hand in front of the camera if you want to uh, hop in and make some comments. And if you don't, then I will volunteer you. <laughs> no takers, no responses. And maybe I'm not seeing everybody's hand here. Um, let's go. All right, I'm gonna to have to call on a few of you. Um, Jim Sapelsa, if I could get you in. Um, familiar with Moran's work? Um, what, what's your reaction? And, and maybe talk a little bit about the kind of work you do and maybe um, uh, a, a compare and contrast with the, the, this style of work. Well, it looks like I've got you muted, Jim. Should be asking to unmute. And then I'll go to Carol and Patricia. Oh, nope, still don't have you, Jim. Well, maybe we're not gonna get to get you in, Jim. 
I can't seem to get you unmuted there. So let me go. Uh, let me go to Carol, and then I'll go to Patricia and Jim. If we can get you in, we'll we'll pull you in. Good morning, Carol. Hi. Good morning. Um, I am not familiar with his work, but of many of the Hudson River School painters that he's similar to, um, the whole romanticized view of nature is is nice, fine. Um, I think what impresses me most about it is the compositions. I find his compositions to be very strong and compelling. His focus points, and uh, and that's kind of my takeaway. That's probably the first thing I look at when I look at other people's art is the compositions. And uh, he does a great job. Yeah, and Carol, um, share with everyone. Do you paint any landscapes? Um, uh, <laughs> uh, no. no, my work's abstract expressionist, but. Uh, Composition is a cornerstone of my my uh, work process. Yeah, and so um, do you feel like there could be in in his work? Are there any similarities in terms of what he's trying to achieve or the effect to to what you might be trying to do, or is it a completely different uh, process? Well, I don't, I don't want to put words in his mouth on what he's trying to achieve, but I think he does a uh, great job of of um, guiding the eye through his work. Um, I like his color selections um, and uh, his, you know, strong use of foreground is, uh, is always a useful tool. So, you know, at varying times I've used all of that. Okay, good. Yeah, so um, it, it, it's interesting, right? To kind of see um, artists work in context and it can be interesting to kind of think about an art. Here's an artist who, um, you know, has a place in art history. Now, whether we're, we're um, greatly inspired or I'm just slightly interested, that, that's a little bit up to us, but um, the, the museums have the work and, and it's uh, it kind of been predetermined from our perspective that this is an artist who achieved some success in his life. Uh, Patricia, let me go to you. Should be asking you to unmute there. Unmute. Gotcha. Uh, I love his colors, but the one that of the trees and all, I love the perspective in that one. I, I don't see it up now, but that one. And almost as an afterthought, you see a figure lying in the forefront in the corner. But it's beautiful, the, the atmosphere in it. And going back, I would love to just sit there and while away my time. Yes. Yeah, and, and that's kind of an interesting effect that obviously as a, a landscape painter, um, he achieved and, and I would suspect many landscape painters are trying to achieve is to take us away to a place that maybe either we've been and feels familiar or a place that's completely new to us. And, and Moran achieved um, both of those things. Excellent. Um, Kate. Let's it looks like we've still got you muted. Let me ask. There okay. we go. Okay. When I when I've looked at Moran's work and then I look at Beerstadt's work, I'm, all I can think of is that that grand landscape, and um, I do see similarities to that. And so I can see why people say, you know, it is very reminiscent of the Hudson School, um, and they're massive painting. <laughs> yes. Um, so, and, and that's kind of interesting. Let, let's talk about that for just a minute. Let's talk about the scale, both the scale and kind of the scope of the work, right? Because um, it's not just that these are large paintings, but the compositions work to achieve this effect of um, well, I've got the one up here that's that's a little more intimate, and, but even even this piece, this is a 16 by 20 inch canvas, so this is relatively tiny compared to some of the others. And yet, um, if if I hadn't put the size on here, we might not have known that. Looking at the composition, the effect is still of um, you know the landscape receding into a haze in the background. Um, you know, a very distant um, uh, vista. This is not an intimate portrait. This is still a grand portrait. This one, I think, is the one that uh, most makes me think, and, and the reason I include it, I'm a big fan of, of J.M.W. Turner as well, and this certainly captures a lot of that same kind of atmosphere that Turner would, would get into his work. He, able to um, convey detail 
Um, and, and yet, um, just a very moody, um, maybe even leaning a little bit more toward the, the impressionistic. But I wonder, um, are there any of you here who likewise strive to capture and share um, you know, imagery at a grand scale, scale whether it's a landscape or, or even other um, images? And, and how difficult is what he is achieving? How difficult is it to achieve this kind of effect? Feel free to hop right in. I, you can even just unmute yourself and hop in. Um, piece of cake, not, not much talent involved in achieving what he's achieving here. I'll give you another one. Yeah, no, maybe? Um, so, you know, uh, I do enormous landscapes and I totally get, you know, how difficult it is to do them on site because I've tried. Uh, and, and then there's the problem of shipping them, right? For us, for contemporary artists, but nothing is more grand than having a giant landscape in your house because it's like being able to leave your living room and go somewhere else daily. I mean, it's an eye line. Yes. Yeah, you've kind of torn out a wall, right? And open it to this vista of... Um you know, a, a scene that, as you say, has the ability to, to take you away. Um, and, and isn't that, um, you know, one of the things that I would suspect many of us are trying to achieve in our art, a, a, a transformative experience, um, taking us out of the day to day and um, reminding us of the beauty of the world that we live in, creating a sense of, of calm and wonder and awe. I mean, that is a, a very powerful effect. Anyone else want to hop in and comment on those effects that are being achieved, Kate? Um, I think, you know, when you got these huge grand landscapes, you really have to be a master of creating that sense of distance with your color and value. And he's really good at that. Yes, you, you get that recession into the, the distance here. Um, and and you can almost, it almost feels like he has recreated the focal length of your, you, you know, your eye to, to um, have that uh, recede into the background and get a very naturalistic depiction of, um, of, of the landscape and the effect that you achieve as, as you're looking over a distance. I would cool. love now to get a comment from, oh, Melanie, let me pull you in. I was just thinking, um, I'm not familiar with his work. I'm sure I learned about him in art history, but <laughs> I, I don't know where it went. Um, but the, um, like the one of the, we were just looking at with the water, the movement he achieves, I mean, he's incredibly talented for sure. Um, you know, the falls in the background, I can just hear them, you know, yeah. with, with his paint quality. Um, I think he's truly a master. Beautiful. Yeah, so um, this one, I also, I, I have a little bit of a personal tie to this one. I grew up in southern Idaho, and um, Shoshone Falls was about 20 miles from the house where I grew up. My grandparents wow. live maybe a mile from these falls. Now, um, unfortunately, the canyon has now been, um, uh, they, they've run several dams and, you know, have hydroelectric production there, so you don't get quite this same effect, but it's still a stunning locale um, and, and the vistas are quite amazing. And, you know, I looked at this image, and I'm like, oh, I'm there. I'm back in Idaho. I'm, ex I'm experiencing this. I saw a couple of, Linda, let me go to you. And then um, we'll try and get Jim in again. On mute. Okay. Um, I did a little book that I, for some reason, it, it kind of fell through before I finished it, about William Henry Jackson, who was a photographer, who was a contemporary. And uh, these Western paintings were actually political. Um, he went, uh, Moran and, and Jackson were friends, and they went along with um, expeditions. There were summer expeditions of scientists and, um, and photographers and uh, mainly Moran and Jackson, yeah, who uh, documented these places. And the idea was to take the images 
to Congress and to make sure that, that these places were preserved. And uh, that's how Yellowstone got to be, uh, was because of Jackson and Moran's images. Um, and these, this, it's amazing that he painted this on site because I've stood there and it yes. looks exactly like that. And the light is changing all the time. And while plain air is not my thing, um, I do it with friends because it's fun. And it is very difficult. And the, the guy was absolutely gifted and a great technician. And um, it would be interesting to compare, I haven't done it, to compare these landscapes with ones being done in um, the Netherlands at the time, because they did some pretty amazing stuff too. Um, but uh, that the the romantic kind of vision here is is something that was done so well and so extensively at the time that we kind of don't have to do it. I mean, who could do better than that with that particular? Yes. That's a really interesting point, Linda. Um, you know, in in some ways, and, and certainly among contemporary art, our critics, our contemporary critics, um, romanticism is not uh, applied as a compliment. Um, you know, it is it is potentially a, a derisive term. And, and you're right. I mean, th this was very well explored. It fit with the tastes of the time. And, and certainly there are still artists who could, could be in this vein of, of um, romanticism. And, and certainly um, there are collectors and, and buyers who are still drawn to that. Um, but it is certainly also not the only ideal that an artist might be striving for in, in depicting the landscape or, or any other subject matter. And I want to, I'm going to come back to your point about this being uh, potentially political, but uh, let, let's go to Lori first and then we'll go to Leslie. Uh, am I unmuted? Yep, we've got gotcha. you. Okay. Um, I was greatly influenced by Thomas Moran when I got back into painting in the 90s. And I do love realism and I love romantic realism. Um, I've changed over the years, but you had asked earlier about um, doing a, a large scale work. And years ago, I did a mural type work. And I have to say that the amount of studies that I had to do to design and capture the different parts of the landscape was um, tremendous. Yes. Um, and I imagine that Thomas Moran, he did a lot of um, sketches when he was on site. And um, we have books and books and books of, yes, of those yes. sketches. Yeah. Yes. And I am totally blown away by thinking about what it took to come up with those grand pieces. I don't ever expect to get to that point, but I am inspired by them. Yeah, I am um, a very interesting point. I mean, and, and kind of points to, um, I think, a factor that we can all relate to, and that is the work that is involved in creating art. Um, I, I read there was, I came across a site that had some quotes from Moran's daughter and, and many other family members um, became artists. I'm not sure if his daughter did, but um, she mentioned that um, her father, uh, Thomas Moran would work in the studio for upwards of 13 hours every single day um, that he was, um, uh, you, you know, just a very, very hard worker was was constantly in the studio um, and and obviously also out in the field creating. Um, but but boy, there's sure something to be said. Even as he was achieving success, he was still working very, very hard to capture the imagery in the way that mm -hmm. um, that he wanted to. Leslie, let me go to you. I should be asking you to unmute, or you can click on the microphone. Can you hear me now? Yep, gotcha. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> um, I have always been struck by Moran's work. And as I mentioned in my notes, this is a revisit for me. Um, it's been some time since I've studied his work, but go back to the trees, if you could. That one. Uh, it has such a chapel like focal point in it that it, th I think that's of all of his work, the most striking one. Um, and especially his use of vermilion in the foreground. 
versus the cerulean blue in the background. It, it's absolutely stunning. And the timing of this webinar couldn't be better because I'm in the process of doing a mural for my husband oh. in his, in his uh, pool table room, and I got stuck. <laughs> and so, thank you. I'm I'm now unstuck. <laughs> oh, good, good. Well, we aim to aim to help. <laughs> yes, thank you, Leslie. I mean, it it, it is amazing. Um, and I would encourage you, um, you know, especially if you haven't had a chance to spend some time looking at his work, there are some amazing high resolution images online and some great books uh, available of Moran's work and, and Bierstadt and uh, Thomas Cole and some of the, the artists, even if you don't in particularly, um, aren't particularly drawn to the landscape and, and, and romantic work, I would suggest it's still worth the time to, to dive in and get a little bit of a sense of what it was that uh, that they were were achieving. Uh, let's see, I've got another Leslie, Leslie, um, and I think it's uh, skates. Let me see if I can. Leslie, I think I've got you. Right. It, yes. You can hear me, right. Got okay. you loud and clear. It's skates it is, yes. Skeets, Hi. perfect. Uh, it's really nice to be involved in this and um, being in Britain I'd not heard of Thomas Moran before but I've just done what you said I've just looked up his his images on my phone and discovered he must have come to Scotland at some point because there's um, a beautiful picture of Glencoe and also Tantallon Castle which is just down the coast from Edinburgh where I am um, so yeah I was very excited to see those and thank you for drawing him to my attention. Yes. I, I'm a landscape artist myself, but um, I paint plein air in the field rather than these big things, which yeah. there must be so much work, so much work in them. Yeah, yeah. we can imagine. And, and yes, um, and, and again, I have not done as much study of Moran's life and, and work as I have some other artists, um, but um, in the little that I have done, he did spend time in England. Um, he spent quite a bit of time um, studying um, Turner's work there and, and uh, visiting the museums. Um, and so it wouldn't surprise me at all that he uh, made some forays into other parts of the UK to, to get uh, subject matter and, and to paint. And you know, obviously he's got a lifetime of work um, decades and decades of work, there's a tremendous amount of subject matter available to look at there. Um, Jim, did I get you back? Um, there yeah, we go, I finally, gotcha. I, I found my- um, You found I, your voice. I, I, <laughs> yeah, I upgraded to uh, Windows 11 and everything's in a different spot. Anyway. Yes. Um, yeah, uh, fortunately uh, or unfortunately, I'm really not familiar with, with Thomas Moran till, till today. Uh, I may have, you know, over the years, the uh, been in front of one of these but fortunately i am you know being from cleveland cleveland museum we do have several examples of the hudson river you know thomas cole uh the few of florence uh you know this, i mean they all remind me of a similar thing or um uh, frederick church anyway yes when you have the the um the, in an area uh, in a museum and you can actually stand in front of one of these it's just so incredibly beautiful and uh what i always like about a lot of these and i see he does a lot of this too are, are the little little people and little uh, details they put in to give you an idea of the scale yeah we can see that in this piece if you look a at native the american or people or uh a, you know a home or something and uh, th those always fascinate me and i know that like say i I'll, I'll certainly look into this and see if Cleveland has any of his work. I imagine they do. But you I never would know. imagine anyway, so. Um, the thing is, is I know that they're very popular galleries with young artists, with with kids, with elementary school kids, and all that. And it really does. Uh, I mean, I, I'm I'm like uh, well, I'm not I'm a, a, a you know abstract, more minimal minimalist uh, painter. Uh, I've done very little landscape, and when I did, it was just it was watercolor, simple, you know, uh, things like that. But uh, when I get stuck, a lot of times what I'll, I'll do is I'll, I'll throw in a horizon line, and it just turns everything. You know. So even though I am a you know minimalist and abstract, I do a lot of times rely on the sky, the earth, and the and the and even the sea, you know, elements like that. 
but uh, these things are just phenomenal. You know, they're to, so uh, if anyone can get in front of one for real, take advantage of that. That's yeah, it certainly it is one thing to um, you know get to view a variety of them online mm -hmm. or in a book, but these these artworks really do come into their full power when you're experiencing them in oh, person yeah. at scale. Um, to see the brush work, um, to think about um, you know working at that scale, thinking about all of the the work that would have gone into composing the piece and then the, you know the uh the labor that would have been involved in in creating the painting yeah. it's it, it is uh, quite stunning I, I also um you know kind of kind of going back um it's also interesting to think about the purpose of these artworks um and the effect that they were having um that i would say to a certain extent, um, we've maybe lost a little bit in the art world. And that was that, um, you know, in the, the 19th century, well, and obviously prior to that, and even into the, the, the mid 20th century, a lot of the experience um, that I might have had as a, uh, as a citizen in seeing distant places was coming to me via a talented artist depiction of that, um, that place. You know, if you think about um, photography was still nascent at this point, and, um, you know, certainly as you go back to um, some of the, the earlier artists who were depicting uh, the Western United States, but, um, you know, even if the artists who were depicting the Alps or Asia, these might have been the only experiences um, that, that people would have had in seeing those distant locales. And so it wasn't, um, you know, today, to a certain extent, um, art seems a little bit remote, I think, to a lot of people, a little bit exclusive, even maybe a little bit exclusionary. You see these prices and the galleries and museums that it's in, and a lot of people just don't feel like they have access. And I think that art was very different for people who were experiencing it um, you know, in the late uh, 19th century and early 20th century, where you'd have these exhibitions and tens of thousands of uh, people would come to see the work and, um, and, and have a transformative experience via that work. Um, and as, as I read in the, the biography at the beginning, um, a lot of these works were commissioned um, either by the government to kind of give a sense of um, what the opportunities were in, in expanding to the West or um, you, you know, a lot of times railroad magnets or um, other wealthy figures and patrons would commission the work and, and then have it on display to the public. Um, and, you know, everyone on the street would have heard of Thomas Moran, would, or at least would have um, potentially have heard of the work and had an opportunity to see it and via that work experience, um, uh, you know, have experiences that they, they maybe wouldn't have otherwise had. And and I wonder, for those of you here, um, you know, as you're painting, how much are you thinking about the experience that the viewer is going to have? And what are you trying to achieve in that? Or is that something that you're not really spending much time thinking about? Uh, Linda? Oh, almost got gotcha. you. Yeah. There we oh. go. I didn't know whether you'd want to hear any more from me or not. Well, absolutely. Well, with me, what what I'm working on now is um, landscape, also, but um, it's intimate landscape, so that um, people. I, I'm thinking that I'm going to get people to look at ordinary things about small things in the landscape that they wouldn't usually see about. Um, so you're abs taking them on a different kind of journey, right? Yeah, that abstraction is not really different from realism, you know, that even like uh, microscopic even as more in, intimate than what, what I'm doing right now, which is details of a, of a rock formation, instead of showing the whole rock formation, which is interesting and a lot like the, the, the first Hudson River scene that you had there. Um, I just show 
a little tiny part of the, of the rocks, you know, the light and shadows on the rocks, or the light and shadows on a part of a bridge support. Um, that it's still landscape, but you know, I, I want people to be able to see um, see things that they would usually miss that are right close to them instead of things that are far away. Yeah, and isn't that the opportunity that an artist has is to uh, maybe no longer do we have quite the same opportunity, at least in the landscape, to share a vista that someone probably hasn't seen. I mean, people do have the ability to travel and they can visit Yellowstone or, or <clears throat> Yosemite, um, but <clears throat> we have the opportunity to make them see or invite them to see things in a different way or, or get a little bit of a different perspective. And, and I would suggest that even an abstract artist um, or a figurative painter has that same opportunity to, to draw attention and to create that same kind of sense of awe and wonder just at a different scale or, or with a different perspective. Um, Kate, did you want to jump back in? Yeah, I, I very often I had the viewer in mind um, when I'm painting my horse paintings, I'm really into the relationship. And just about everybody's like, oh, you really captured how they're relating. And with the landscapes are always smaller. And sometimes I think about the landscapes that you see in museums that are like this really precious Jewel-like. Yeah, view. and so I've been starting to do that as well. It, you know, people, you know, like to come into a little bit closer. Yeah. Yeah, there are opportunities at, uh, at every scale. Uh, Leslie, did you want to hop back in again? I, I did. I just wanted to comment that I had to bring myself back into context looking at these works yesterday because at the time that Moran was doing these, gigantic canvases, the effort and the physicality that he had to uh, make part of his daily life just to just to paint these in plain air because uh, Wyoming was not even a state yet. Right. That was still the grand frontier. And uh, it, uh, just bringing the canvas and having to manage the paint had to be, you know, it, you know, did he get up at four o'clock in the morning to set up before the sun yes. came up? <laughs> yeah, certainly um, an amazing uh, amount of effort required to, to get to, this, to, to the locale and, and to create the artwork and, and even taking sketches back to the studio and working from those, you know, not having the ability uh, necessarily, although he worked with photographers, so I, I wonder if he didn't have some reference material from those photographers, but, but still it would have been a very different process than, than maybe what uh, we might have the experience. Now, let, let me throw this out here. Anyone wanna hop in and say, yeah, it's, it's okay, but we're over it, right? The, the, the landscape has been done. Um, and it's great, it belong, but it belongs in a museum. Um, you, you know, anyone want to take a little bit of a contrary view? No? No criticism that we're willing to offer? Uh, no takers? Because certainly, oh, Beverly, let me pull you in. Maybe you're not going to okay. do that, but let, 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 not, I'd love to hear your comments. Yeah, I'm not really going to criticize because obviously it's fabulous, but um, I find it quite interesting that you said he came after Turner. So also as a British person, I'm very familiar with Turner and I had not seen Moran before. But for me, I find Turner more modern, to especially the late Turner. I see parallels between them, this traveling around, traveling to other countries, doing these grand tours and the watercolor sketches and everything. But I feel that Turner went further than yeah. Moran. And then with that, you showed the orangey one. Well, with, with Turner, he would not have stuck with just the orange. For me, that's just a very one uh, colored painting, whereas Turner always had the blues and the grays and the whites and, the, and a lot more light in it, actually, and a lot more energy in the brush stroke. Yeah. So if I had to choose between Moran and Turner, I would definitely go Turner. Turner's I'm always direction. looking for a life 
in um, an artwork. And I find these are very atmospheric. And I really love his cliffs with the high horizon. And I've now gone towards abstract, but that's often, um, I really like that sort of composition where you've got this very pale or, or even dark strip at the top and then and then a sense of this sort of very dramatic fall coming down but yeah that yes. that's my only criticism i'd say like he feels more traditional than than turner yeah and that's interesting um because of course from here we are several you know over 100 and 150 years later and so for us turner is he's a classic artist and and a national treasure and um uh, for for England and and it's easy to think of of his work as traditional. Well, that's not the way it was thought of when he was creating it, certainly. And um, uh, it, it it is just kind of interesting. And if you you know if you haven't had an opportunity to spend much time um, you know delving into art history and seeing the the various artists and the movements and and trying to get a little bit bit of a sense of of the um, kind of the the continuity you know even though you have these huge breaks in art history where you know the impressionists come in or the abstract expressionists or the minimalists it, it is still all part of the same conversation even though there are very unique ways of expressing um, that that artistic vision and so um, I, I think it's beneficial for all of us and for me as an art appreciator and, and, and a, a gallerist to kind of try and keep an open perspective and, and look for, um, you know, maybe, maybe um, Willem de Kooning is not my cup of tea, but what can I take from looking at his work or a Moran's work or a Turner's work um, that, that can help me better understand and create context for the work that I'm seeing or producing. And, and, and so we've done it. We've run ourselves out of time. I hope you enjoyed this uh, look at, a, at an artist's work that um, uh, <clears throat> gives us a little bit broader perspective. And again, from time to time, we will definitely be inviting other artists in um, to join us from beyond the grave um, so we can enjoy their work. If you have a suggestion of an artist you might like us to feature um, in, in kind of a retrospective in an art history kind of way, um, email me. You all have my email address, jason at xanadugallery.com. I would love to take your suggestions for future um, critique groups. Next week, um, we'll come back to earth and um, spend some time looking at each other's work a little bit. So be sure and join us for a review of one of your fellow artists' work. Have a great week, everyone. We'll look forward to seeing you then. Take care. Oh, <laughs> let's see if 